almost suddenly getting quiet, so we might as well begin. Um, well, my name is Michael Anderson. I'm the president and CEO of the Oklahoma City Museum of Art, and it is my distinct honor to welcome you to the member's preview of Kier's Tommy Beyond the Frame in our lecture by Godfrey Cheshire. So tonight, before we begin, I just want to thank our exhibition sponsors uh, who have uh, really generously supported this exhibition. You see them all on the screen, but I'll read them off as well. Uh, Leslie and Clifford Hudson, the Farazana family, Oklahoma Humanities, Jeanette and Rand Elliott, Alfred Hall, uh, Monahan Morris, Julia Hall, Philip and Heather Busey, Karen Delaney, Jean Rainbolt, Janice Films, and MK2 Films. And let's give them all a round of applause for the support. <laughs> Likewise, I want to uh, welcome our other two guests this evening who are on our sustainers panel on Wednesday. We have a uh, Distinguished uh, filmmaker, uh, Oscar-nominated filmmaker, Ramin, Bari, uh, Ramin Barani. And we have Ahmed Kirstami from the uh, Kirstami Foundation. He was not just instrumental. I mean, it's because of him that this exhibition happened. We're very grateful to him and his uh, vision for having the Kirstami exhibition in Oklahoma. And thank you so much for everything you did, Ahmed. We are really grateful. And now on to our very distinguished speaker, Godfrey Cheshire. Godfrey is an award-winning film critic, journalist, and filmmaker based in New York City. Uh, he's a specialist in Iran Iranian cinema, not just a specialist, he's, he's America's specialist on Iranian cinema and on the films of Abbas Kiarostami. And he's written on the subject for a number of publications, including the New York Times, Variety, Newsweek, Film Comment, and Cineast. He is the co-founder of the Iranian Film Festival New York, and he's the author of Conversations with Kiarostami. If you haven't yet gotten your book, it's in the bookstore. There's a book signing tomorrow, so get your copy and get it signed by Godfrey, which is from 2019. And also, his, he has a forthcoming book, uh, In the Time of Kiarostami, Writings of Iranian Cinema, which we will be uh, also selling in our bookstore. So please help me, uh, join me in welcoming Godfrey Cheshire. Uh, thank you, Michael, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, this, is a, this event is something of a technological innovation for me in that I'm using this uh, speaking thing that's attached to my head, and I'm also doing this uh, visual thing that I've never done before that hopefully will help uh, <laughs> advance my cause here tonight. But I must say I'm very delighted to be here. Um, this is my first trip to Oklahoma. I must say I've, I came a couple of days early, and I've been able to look around and been Thanks to friends from Stillwater, I've been able to look around Oklahoma City and Tulsa and everything, and it's, we've had such beautiful weather, too. I'm really you know, dazzled by the whole place. And I'm also dazzled by this exhibition that we have here of Kiarostami. I, I knew that I was coming here to speak about the films, being a film critic, but I really had no idea that uh, this exhibition would include so much more. Um, if you haven't been up to see the Kiarostami works that are on the floors above, I mean, you've got to do it, and I, it's something I think you can return to many times over the course of the next few months because there's so much there, and it's all so well presented. Uh, I, it really, you know, having looked at Kiarostami exhibits all over the place, all over the world uh, over many years, this is really the best one I've ever seen. So I want to... I want to... I want to congratulate the museum and the Kiarostami Foundation for such a superb job. This should be a model for other Kiarostami exhibits that ought to be all over the place. So I hope that we'll get the attention it deserves. But um, I'm here to, I'll say something about the other works, but I'm mainly here to talk about the films. Um, and I have been um, writing about Iranian cinema. This is actually, this fall is the 30th anniversary of my first encounter with Iranian cinema. Uh, people sometimes ask me how that happened. It, it did because um, in uh, 1992, uh, one of the editors of Film Comment uh, asked me if I would go to see the first festival of post-revolutionary Iranian films to be presented in New York, which was at Lincoln Center. Um, and I had no idea that there was anything going on in Iran cinematically. I, even though I prided myself in being a critic who was very you know, interested and attuned to international cinemas. I, I didn't have a clue about this, and, uh, but I, I, I said yes, not because I wanted to learn anything about Iranian cinema, but because I wanted to write for film comment. Um, so I went to this festival, and I was really, I think it's maybe the most uh, 
amazing uh, revelatory event I've ever had in my life as a critic. I was so amazed at the films that I saw and all of the, uh, just, it was evidence of a really rich and complex cinema that I had no idea it even existed, but uh, a lot of very, very strong uh, directors, filmmakers, auteurs that um, I thought were very, so impressive in their distinctive visions of the world in cinema that I was very enthusiastic in writing about all this. Um, I, Abbas Kiarostami was one of those that I was impressed with, but I won't say he was the other, only one. He was one of several that included Darius Merjwi and Bahram Bezai and uh, Amir Nadari and some others, and uh, Mohsen Makhmobaf, um, that I thought were all sort of world-class filmmakers that I was just discovering for the first time, uh, all of whom had had very serious careers until that point. Um, but even though Kiarostami didn't stand out above those others, there was one film of his that really did, which was a film called Close Up, that I just was totally amazed by. And I'll say a little bit more about that when I'm talking about his films, but Close Up was the one that I started my article and film comment about, and is one that I still regard as my favorite Kiarostami film and maybe my favorite Iranian film, uh, and is so important uh, uh, in, in his work and in terms of Iranian cinema, I think in world cinema. So he, uh, you know, he impressed me in that way. And then um, I started writing about Iranian cinema. I've been so interested in what I discovered in this first festival that I went on writing about it wherever I could find Iranian films, and that included in covering the Cannes Film Festival, which I started doing in the mid-'90s. Uh, and then in the later in the 90s, the Iranians... Uh, the, the people in the culture ministry in Iran uh, seemed to be pleased with the things that had been reading, that I've been writing, and they started inviting me to Iran to the annual film festival there. I started doing that in 1997. I met Abbas Kiarostami in 1994 when he came to New York for the first time with a film uh, that was uh, Through the Olive Trees. And, we, you know, I had an interview with him, but I thought a friendship sparked in that instance, and then it continued when I started going to Iran in 1997. Uh, and, and continued then in the, in the years following uh, up to his uh, death in, in, 19, in 2016. Um, and so it was, it was great to, to get, I felt very privileged and you know, happy to know him because he was a wonderful person as well as an, a you know, consummate artist. Uh, so I've had you know, this uh, long um, sort of relationship with him and his work that uh, I've written about you know, in, in, a, in a bunch of different places and including in the two books that were mentioned uh, before, but um, I wanted to say something about my experience with, with Iran. Um, when I st started going there uh, in 1997, it was with a, a big question in my mind. I, I really was very curious as to how this country that you know, had been so, gotten so much negative publicity, to say the least, uh, in the United States and, uh, and the world since uh, the Iranian Revolution of 1979, how this country uh, that seemed to be a repressive theocracy had produced this amazing cinematic renaissance in a way. Um, and when I did get to Iran, I, I came away with, after that first, uh, that first trip, with uh, a number of, uh, well, a couple especially of uh, uh, reasons that were behind this. And when I would ask uh, Iranians, uh, they would, uh, a lot of them would immediately say, the Iranian New Wave. You need to understand the Iranian New Wave. And I, I came to understand that the Iranian New Wave was the Iranian cinema that uh, uh, existed before the revolution, really between 1969 and 1979. Uh, it was sparked by a couple of films uh, in, in 1969 that really led the way, much like Francois Truffaut's 400 Blows and Godard's uh, um, uh, Breathless had done 10 years before in France. Uh, and there was an explosion of, of, of filmmaking that followed this, uh, most of it by young filmmakers. There were females as well as males. Uh, and really, a lot of it still very impressive to see to this day. But it, is, it was amazing to me when I first started looking at all these films that I was pointed toward that they didn't get that much attention outside of Iran. And I can only explain this by saying that I think it had to do with the fact that the, you know, the, the West, uh, Europe and the United States were s having such an explosion of their own sort of new wave kinds of cinemas, either, either you know, in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, the French new wave continuing on, Bergman, Fellini, 
that whole generation of filmmakers and in the US, Scorsese and Coppola and all these films that this, you know, the US and Europe didn't need to look far afield for other, uh, other examples of really good cinema, although if they had, I think people would have been really, uh, really impressed with what they'd seen from Iran. But anyway, that, that era came and went uh, without getting much international attention. But the other thing that I sort of began to learn about and to appreciate was the great uh, Persian culture that goes back thousands of years that includes so much amazing poetry and literature and visual arts and uh, everything that is just a very rich culture that has been there for you know, hundreds and thousands of years. And that, I think, fed into the, all the arts that uh, came in the modern era, and especially cinema, and especially the cinema that came with the new wave. So what happened, though, was that uh, the, the Iranian Revolution of 1979 basically shut down the Iranian cinema. About a third of the movie theaters were burned down by extremists of one sort or another. Uh, and it was only the day after the Ayatollah Khomeini came back to uh, Iran in February of 1979 that uh, he gave permission, in effect, for cinema to continue. Some of the hardliners would have liked it to be eradicated as a Western toxin for good, but he gave, he was, uh, Khomeini was impressed with some of this uh, new wave cinema he'd seen, uh, and he gave his permission as, for a new cinema to be created that would be uh, you know, socially beneficent uh, and, and, and valuable culturally. So <clears throat> thanks to that, some young intellectuals in the uh, Ministry of Culture helped sort of reconstitute the cinematic, the whole cinematic apparatus, beginning with, you know, ticket prices and you know, uh, equipment and film processing and all this. And this was during the 1980s when Iran was at war with Iraq, so it was a very, very challenging time to do something like this. But it did succeed this uh, this effort, and so there were films coming out uh, beginning in the mid 1980s that continued to come out and and make their way into foreign festivals, um, and. Some of these films, uh, one of the calling cards that got this uh, post-revolutionary cinema noticed internationally were films about children. And this was something that Abbas Kiarostami had, had uh, uh, been a part of and been very in instrumental in. He began uh, his career uh, during the, the, the age of the Iranian New Wave. Uh, he was one of the, the main uh, filmmakers that came out of that. Um, but he, get, he began his film uh, making his films in an organization called, uh, that Iranians called Kanun, which is uh, the uh, Center for the Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults. Uh, he was born in 1940. He was raised in a middle-class family in Tehran. Uh, he started making um, film commercials. He did graphic arts. He designed credit sequences for films. Uh, and then uh, due to a uh, so couple of commercials he made that had to uh, really nice performances by children, as I understand it, he was invited to set up a filmmaking division for Kanun, this, this organization that was dedicated to the, the you know, instruction of young uh, children and ch young adults, meaning mainly adolescents. And uh, he made uh, quite a number of films. I'll talk about these during the, uh, during the 1970s. Uh, and then after the revolution, the uh, new authorities that started were, were trying to uh, restart the cinema they not only wanted, wanted to restart it as you know, an industry and as a commercial operation, but also as an artistic one. They wanted, in short, uh, films to go abroad and sort of win friends and influence people for the Islamic Republic, which was having very challenging image problems uh, up until that point. So they invited people like Kiarostami to come back and start working. And one of the things that he and other filmmakers told me about that era was that they thought that films about children could be, it's not only something that they had been doing prior to the revolution and had become good at, but that it could be things that they could do within the, the restrictions that the Islamic Republic had put on filmmaking, which forbade a lot of things that had to do with women's you know, appearance and you know, any kind of sort of mature uh, adult relationships between men and women. Just You could leave all those problems out if you made films about children. And, so those, some of those initial films that were made were among the ones that were uh, really acclaimed uh, at, at international festivals. So that was sort of what, what launched uh, this, this new uh, post-revolutionary cinema. And uh, it became uh, extremely uh, 
extremely important internationally and recognized and successful uh, during the 1990s. That, that decade was sort of the miraculous decade for the revival and the international acclaim of, a lot, uh, of Iranian cinema. And Kiarostami really was the one that became the most internationally acclaimed. I think some of the other directors that I mentioned earlier uh, from that generation, uh, from the New Wave generation, as well as some that came, uh, came up afterwards, uh, including uh, Mohsen Makhmabaf, uh, they were you know, directors of, uh, of talent uh, akin to Kiarostami's, but uh, he had a really a great uh, string of successes that led him to become sort of the most prominent one over a period of a, a few years and a few films. This began with the film uh, called Where's, the, Where's My Friend's House that was uh, released uh, in 1989 internationally. It played at the Locarno Film Festival. It won several prizes, and that put the spotlight on him. And then this film that I mentioned earlier, Close Up, which came out in 1990, even though it wasn't taken up by any major festivals, it really, I think, struck critics in a lot of places as being just an extraordinary film that on his next uh, feature film, uh, 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 And Life Goes On in 1992, that was the first of his films to be taken into the Cannes Film Festival. And from then on, he had a very rapid ascent, winning prizes at Cannes and culminating in the, the winning the Palme d'Or, the, the greatest prize in filmdom, I, I would say, aside from the Best Picture Oscar, he won the Palme d'Or in 1997 with the film that we're going to see uh, uh, you know, tonight, uh, Taste of Cherry. Um, so he had a, a really rapid rise, and uh, I'm going to talk some about uh, you know what uh, I want to give you a kind of an overview of people uh, who, especially who have not seen a lot of these films, um, uh, uh, you know, an overview of his career as a filmmaker that maybe will hope help help orient you toward uh, what you're going to be able to see here in the next six months because. Uh, Kiarostami's films were restored three or four years ago by MK2, the French distributor of the films, and with collaboration with Janus Films. And so all of these films, these restorations, which are very beautiful, uh, were released starting three years ago, and they're the ones that are on tour that are here to see. And I, I think, though, uh, so many of them really haven't been written about that much uh, that it's maybe helpful to you if I give you kind of an overview of them. But if you came into this uh, room tonight not knowing anything about who Abbas Kiarostami was, there's the man himself. Uh, I have two quotes that I would start out with. One was uh, an, um, an arts curator, a very prominent one, who I met uh, a couple of years ago, said to me, uh, you know, Andy Warhol was the last giant we had in the art world. Kiarostami was the last giant in cinema. That's one quote. The other quote is um, from Jean-Luc Godard, who supposedly said in the 1990s, cinema is Griffith to Kiarostami. That is D.W. Griffith at the first of the cinema, start of cinema in, in uh, Abbas Kiarostami. And I think, you know, in a way, maybe that's too extravagant if it implies that there'll be no giants after him. I don't think it, that's really what Godard was saying, but I do think that it, it's very defensible if you, if you look at it as saying... Um, that he was the last giant of the century of cinema, which was the 20th century, because what happened in his career exploding in the 1990s is something that cinema has very rarely, if ever, seen, in that at the beginning of the 90s, uh, as I can well testify, um, I think most critics in the United States didn't know anything about uh, Iranian cinema, much less Abbas Kiarostami. And at the end of the decade, uh, American critics polled by Film Comment voted him the most important director of the decade, the most important director of the 1990s. I think that's really, really an extraordinary ascent uh, in terms of renown and recognition and perception. But he did it over several films that each, you know, in, in furthered his reputation uh, as a great creator in cinema. So um, I wanted to look at uh, the th what I have called the three. Uh, uh, periods of his work. This, this is something that occurred to me after his death in 2016, looking back at his whole career, that there were three periods, one I call the Kanun period roughly, each of which were run uh, roughly 15 years. The Kanun period uh, includes 
uh, 10 shorts. This is what's in uh, the, the retrospective you're going to see here. Uh, four short features, two features, and one documentary feature. Um, the, the, uh, the short features are roughly an hour in length, and I'll talk a little bit more of each, each one of those. The second period I call the masterworks period. This is the one that made him, the period that made him world famous, uh, starting in uh, the mid-80s and going up through 1999, and this included seven nar narrative features and one documentary feature. And then the last period I call the experimental period, and this included uh, five narrative features, two documentary features, one animated feature, one narrative short, one documentary short, and other shorts. Very, very active period, but it is the masterworks period that really uh, you know, got him his international reputation. So um, the next, uh, I want to say something about what's in the uh, Kanun period. The, the short films, these are the titles, and I put asterisk book by ones that or I guess are particular favorites of mine, or ones that I think are particularly important, but I would sort of recommend all of these films to you. There are two programs. What you're going to see here at the museum are two programs that uh, will contain these, these short films, and I would you know, highly recommend that you see all of them. There's quite a variety of films within uh, this uh, program, um, and uh, they, it's interesting to, to look at the, the short... The short features, uh, there are four of those, and these will be in two different programs. But um, lo looking at the shorts, if you look at uh, Bread and Alley um, and Break Time, the first two, they're short black and white films that I think are really amazing little art films. And he, uh, Abbas Kiristami said that Bread and Alley, he called that the mother of all my films. That really uh, was a film that, it, it's a very simple film of a boy going home through some alleys and encountering a dog, he's carrying bread. It's really, it, 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 it contains all of the elements of his cinema that would come later. Um, I think uh, Akira Kurosawa saw that film and then saw his later films and said, you haven't changed a bit, you know, you haven't developed at all. Uh, and Kurosawa got a kick out of that. But anyway, so all of these films uh, in, seen in these two programs of shorts are really interesting and I think, to me, they're fascinating because they show you where his art came from and how how he developed up until he got to those films that made his reputation. And of these short features, um, The Wedding Suit is a particular favorite of mine. It's a, a film that shows it's about three boys trying to, fighting each other, they're kind of poor boys, over uh, borrowing a, a suit that a uh, tailor is making for a boy to get married in. And uh, it, it's something that has perhaps more comedy and more suspense than any other Kurosami fi uh, film, and I think shows if he'd wanted to go in a real commercial direction what he could have done. The other film, Case Number 1, Case Number 2, is an incredible document of the, Iranian re the era of the Iranian Revolution. It was made in early 1979 when the revolution was uh, you know, in flux, and uh, it's something where Kurosami stages this... Uh, uh, event in uh, a classroom where there's a disagreement uh, among uh, students as to whether uh, people that have created a disruption should be ratted on by their classmates or not. And, and then Kiristami has all of these very prominent Iranian adults discuss, you know, these students should be punished or they should not be punished. And it's just a really fascinating portrait of uh, the revolutionary mentality and what, how people's perceptions change about ethical questions like this. And its, its success, I think, is indicated by the fact that uh, at the end of the, uh, this year, uh, and the film came out, uh, the government gave it a prize, and then they banned it. So, <laughs> so that, that is an amazing film that I definitely would uh, encourage you to see. Um, then the other, the, the narrative features here, the two are The Traveler and The Report. Now, The Traveler is, uh, I think, uh, I've heard Ahmed Kiristami say this is his favorite film of his father. I don't know if that's still the case, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a wonderful film. It is a short film about, I mean, not a short film, a short feature. Of, uh, it's a full-length feature, but it's, uh, it's about a boy in a rural town who uh, wants to go to Tehran for a soccer match. And it's about all the chicanery he gets into to fool his classmates and adults to be able to get on that bus and go to Tehran. Uh, and uh, its ending is wonderfully ironic, but it shows uh, Kiristami's filmmaking skills 
so fully, de fully developed uh, that if you watch you know, his first four films, Bread and Alley in 1970, Break Time in 1972, Experience in 1973, and The Traveler in 74, you can't help but be impressed with what a really full-fledged talent this is, even at that early time. But anyway, like I say, the, th the, the thing to emphasize here that I'd really like to stress is that uh, these films in the Kanun period, basically you can only see here. Uh, I don't know if some of them are on YouTube or not, but um, I, I would really like to see the uh, Criterion people put them out on DVDs, so they'd be more available and such, but uh, as of now, they're only available in these, uh, this touring uh, exhibition. So you folks are very lucky to have the chance to see these films, and I do encourage you to uh, pay attention to the, these films particularly, uh, because um, they're so unavailable generally, and there's so many interesting and delightful uh, parts to them. So, oh, and the documentary feature in this time was, oh, it, first of all, the report was the one kind of adult film he made and was not done through Kanun. And it's about a, a man's uh, marriage falling apart, a, a bureaucrat who is having, having uh, ethical issues in his uh, professional life too. That's really a, a fascinating film and it really projects forward to other things and it really shows what Kiarostami was interested in doing outside the realm of films about children during this pre-revolutionary pre pre period. Uh, and then the documentary feature is First Graders, which was the first of two films he made, two documentaries he made about children uh, and education under the Islamic Republic. And you get the feeling in, very strongly in both of these films that he was really critical of uh, what was being taught and in, in what children were being exposed to uh, in the more regimented, uh, religiously oriented uh, schooling that they were getting um, in the, the Islamic Republic. Um, so, he, you know, those two films show really the concern that he had with education, and in large part because he was raising his two sons, and they were in school uh, at this time. Now, the Masterworks period, this is the one where we have all the films that he became famous for, starting with Where's the Friend's House. I've put uh, hashtags next to the ones that are in what's called the Coker Trilogy. Uh, Where's the Friend's House uh, is the first of those, and Life Goes On is the second, which is also called sometimes Life and Nothing More. Through the Olive Trees is the third. And to explain what the Co Coker Trilogy is, um, the Where's the Friend's House is a film that he made um, based on a script that he wrote about one schoolboy in a village trying to find his uh, schoolmate who'd left his... Uh, notebook behind and, and, and it was threatened by a teacher that if he didn't have his notebook he was going to get all sorts of punishment. So the boy is like trying to find his school his schoolmate going from one village to another. Very charming film and actually the last film that Kiarostami made involving uh, or centered on children, uh, child characters. Uh, and Life Goes On is a film that he made after uh, he found out in 1990, well, there was a huge earthquake in 1990 on his birthday that killed something like 50,000 people, including tens of thousands of children. And a year later, uh, Kiarostami, uh, well, a after he found out that that had happened, he made a very difficult journey up to the village of Coker uh, to see if the children who had been in uh, his previous film had survived. And, and then a year after that, he told the story of doing that at a film festival in Germany, and somebody in the audience said, you ought to make a film about that. And so that's what And Life Goes On is. It's a, a dramatic version of his journey up to Coker to try to find out if the children from uh, Where's the Friend's House had survived. And then Through the Olive Trees is a film about a director making a film about going up to the uh, village. To, and, and so it's just... One film grows out of the other, and it's, it's really, all three films are really amazing. Um, I sometimes ask, what are the best films to start with if you haven't seen any Kiarostami films? And I go, the Coker Trilogy and Close Up are the ones that I would recommend the most because they're all very accessible, but they also, the, the films in the Coker Trilogy, which he didn't obviously uh, intend as a trilogy when he made them, uh, critics started calling them the Coker Trilogy, but their relationship to each other is really fascinating. You don't need to see them in order, and you, if you don't see all of them, it's fine. They each stand alone, but they're really, really a great piece of work overall, uh, the three of them. So I definitely encourage you to see those. And Close Up is the film that I was so struck by on the first encountering these 
Iranian films, and it's about, uh, it, it, it seems to be a documentary, but it's a very, very tricky thing in that it's sort of a documentary and sort of not a documentary. It's about a man, a young man, a poor young man, who is arrested for impersonating the director, uh, Mohsen Makhmabov, to a middle-class family. He, he meets them, he, they start having him to their house, he convinces them that he's going to put them in his next film, da -da -da, and eventually the ruse falls apart and he's arrested. And most of the film has to do with his trial, uh, which Kiarostami films, and Kiarostami actually it insinuates his way into and orchestrates to get the result that he wants. It's a very, very fascinating film. I've never shown that to an audience that didn't really, really like it. And uh, I, I really do think it had a tremendous impact in uh, 1990, in, in that up until then, the films that people had been seeing internationally suggested the Iranian cinema was something like the uh, Italian neorealist, you know, with films about children, poor situations, you know, done, done on location, whereas Close Up introduced this whole thing of films about filmmakers and filmmaking and the social aspects of cinema that were, you know, presented Iranian cinema as something very complex and sophisticated in its view of cinema itself. And so that's why I think that film is so important and, and needs to be seen. So the other two films in this period um, of features, narrative features, are uh, Taste of Cherry, which did take him to the Palme d'Or at Cannes, and this is the film we'll see in a little while, and The Wind Will Carry Us, which was a, a film that is uh, set in Kurdistan. It's about a, a, a film making, a TV crew that goes to film the death of uh, an old woman who doesn't die very inconveniently and gets, they get stranded there. And I think that film has meanings on many levels and it's maybe my second favorite of all these films, so I recommend that. And that also won a, a big prize at the Venice Film Festival. So this was really Kiarostami's uh, miraculous period, this masterworks period of uh, being very, very successful with all of these films. And these uh, the Wind Will Carries was the last celluloid feature he made in Iran. Um, the other film in this period was uh, the documentary feature, Homework, the second film he made about uh, education, which is also a really a fantastic film. So if we go on, uh, yeah, those are the films in the Coker trilogy. If we go on to the next period, this is uh, the exper what I call the experimental period, which uh, begins with narrative features, and these are of various sorts. Uh, ten, but the thing to say about this period uh, as it begins, it really seems to me that after all the success of the previous decade, that Kiarostami sort of decided he just wanted to please himself rather than shooting for top prizes at every festival or whatever. And so there's a great variety among the features here. Um, but the key thing from a sort of a technical aesthetic uh, point of view in this period is that he was converted to digital cinema from celluloid. And the way that this happened was that uh, you'll see under documentaries, uh, the first film in this period is a film called ABC Africa, where he was asked to go by the UN to Africa to uh, make a film, a documentary about uh, the children of AIDS victims. And he went there with his cinematographer and they took little mini digital cameras and they shot a lot of stuff about the, the subject that they were to cover. And they looked at this as being notes for the film that they would come back to Africa and make. But when they got back to Tehran, they thought there was so much good material uh, from these mini DV cameras that they really just edit, they edited that together, and that became ABC Africa. And that, that was, I think, really what converted Kiarostami to uh, digital cinema. And he really embraced it as something that allowed him to make films without the big crews that the, the feature films normally, uh, you know, using film would involve, and, uh, and, and just to make films almost handmade with just a, a few people and very simple cameras that, uh, that uh, could, could be used uh, much more easily than the big c cinema cameras. So, Ken, uh, the first of the narrative features, was the first uh, narrative feature to use this, and uh, it really shows uh, how much freedom Kiarostami felt that it had. It's about a woman who's driving around Tehran uh, picking up various people in her car and uh, having conversations about many different things, but it was obviously something that could, uh, could happen because he could just mount two cameras inside this car and uh, you know, film that way in a much easier and less expensive way than making a regular feature. 
Uh, five dedicated to Ozu is like a film that would really fall under the experimental label in the sense that it is uh, not really a narrative. It just shows this one beach scene and various things happening along this uh, coast in the Caspian Sea. It's, it's really good, but it's, it's not really a narrative. And Shirin is also uh, kind of an experimental film with these women uh, watching a film that you're looking at their reactions. And you don't, he filmed it without the women actually knowing what they were watching. And then he put in the, the, the film that they were watching later. And that's partly on display. Ups, it's, it, it is on display in one of the, uh, the exhibits upstairs. So you can see that without you know, coming to the theater if you want to. Uh, now, the, uh, the last two films under this uh, list are uh, Certified Copy and Like Someone in Love. And these are fully fledged features akin to the ones that he made in the Masterworks period, but they're both made outside of Iran. I think that for various reasons he became uncomfortable with the restrictions of working inside Iran. And so he went and made films in two countries that he really had an affinity with. Uh, Certified Copy was made in, uh, in um, uh, Italy, and it's the first of his films to star an international actor, and that's Juliette Binoche. Uh, prior to this, all the way up until now, Kiristami had mainly used uh, non-professional actors, uh, people he just found on the street, sometimes or with the kids, of course, none of them were professional actors in the earlier films. But in Certified Copy, he used Juliette Binoche, who he had become friends with and I think developed a really good collaboration with. So. If you haven't seen this, or even if you have, I encourage you to come and see this tomorrow. It's a really interesting film, uh, different in a lot of ways than the films he made in Iran, but with u the usual Kiristami uh, stamp on it. And then Like Someone in Love is made uh, in Japan, uh, and that's a, a film that he makes with all Japanese characters and, and actors, uh, and uh, is very, I think, uh, a really accomplished film that got a great deal of acclaim when it came out. The documentary features in this period are ABC Africa, which I've just talked about, 10 on 10, which was a film that he made about the making of 10 and about his, his filmmaking philosophy that went into that. Um, and then the, the experimental period also included the animated feature 24 Frames, which was the last feature that he made, and he didn't complete that. Ahmad Kiristami, who's right here, completed it after his death, which is his one uh, animated feature, and I, you know, I would never have thought that he would have made an animated feature, but it just shows you that he, 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 could, he, he was interested in doing pretty much everything. But this film also comes out of his uh, interest in photography, and he was a very accomplished photographer. You can see a lot of his work upstairs. Um, and in this, he like, takes individual frames of, of, of a photograph and he sort of imagines what happened before and after each image. Uh, so he has 24 frames that are animated that tell stories, and uh, almost none of them involve uh, people. They, a lot of them involve uh, animals or just scenes of nature. He was very much into photographing nature. Um, and then the narrative sh there was a narrative short called Tickets, which was a short feature in, uh, a, short in a feature by three directors. And then there was a documentary short called uh, Roads of Kiristami. All of these are very interesting, and I hope you can, you can see as many of these as you can. Um, otherwise, I think I want to kind of sum up by looking at some of the things that Kiristami's films are known for. Um, one, uh, these films that he, he put it to me, the, these short films that he made, especially the short films for Kanun, were films about but not necessarily for children. And there is in in these films, very quickly established a kind of a humanistic outlook that was really commented on and appreciated. I, I call it the compassionate gaze that he has on all of these characters. Um, and this is sort of where he started out. And, and at the same time, he started out with, uh, I, I think that there was, he had a real interest in documentary uh, capturing of reality. And uh, that was something that he started out with as well, as well as the films about children. And you see that his gifts for observation of humans and human behavior and settings and locations and everything, it's very distinctive from the, from the word go. And, and also his, his gifts with composing these elements and framing stories and framing uh, movements through space of his characters, I think, is striking from, from, from the very beginning. Um, 
He also was really, I, I think, from the very uh, outset of his career, um, dedicated to the idea of a poetic cinema. And in part, I feel sure this comes from his uh, interest in poetry. He was uh, really, uh, he, he told me at one point that he felt sure, uh, without being too immodest, that he knew more poetry by heart than any other Iranian filmmaker. And he did seem to know uh, vast quantities of it and also wrote vast quantities of it. There is a uh, book of translations of his poetry that doesn't include all of it, that's 900 pages in English that you can get that is really remarkable. And he wrote in all kinds of poetic forms. Uh, but I think when he came to making films, he had an idea of making films that had some of the qu uh, qualities of poetry. Uh, and this, it, you know, it, it uh, sort of means several things. I mean, he, one thing that he talked about was the idea of the half-made film, which means that there, in, in er every film, there are certain things that aren't spelled out or presented in the sort of normal, logical, narrative way that a lot of filmmakers uh, present things according to convention. They leave things out so that people read into them, the audience, the viewer reads into the film uh, things that they, they bring into the, the meaning of the film. I think this is something that's really fascinating about his films, and it's something that, you know, when you hear Kiarostami's films talked about, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the terms that's used sometimes is multi-leveled, which means they have different levels of meaning, different ways you can read them, uh, and that's partly because of this, uh, this uh, poetic sense that he had. And in, in a formal sense, he also... Uh, you know, it struck me very early in seeing his films that he will begin a story at a place that you don't expect it to begin, and he'll end it in a place you don't expect it to end. And this is another example of films that are trying to engage the viewer in, in a non-conventional way. And there is, you know, there's, uh, there's a surface simplicity to a lot of these films that I think hides a real complexity to the ideas that they, they contain. And there is, you know, poetically things of allegory and symbolism in the films as well. Um, there are also autobiographical resonances, I think, to these things. And this is something that I became more interested in and more aware of, I think, uh, as I uh, you know, got to know him better over the years and uh, seeing where he you know, factored into these stories that he was telling. The only film that I would say that is really kind of directly autobiographical is and Life Goes On, which is about a director modeled on himself going to this earthquake-stricken area, which that's very obviously a, a, an autobiographical tale. But I think that uh, there's autobiographical dimensions to almost every film of his, especially one, you know, for the male characters. Um, there, I remember one of the very crucial things for me in talking to him uh, over, over these years was uh, I, I said to him about the... the two pre-revolutionary features, the traveler and the report. Now, are these, met, these main characters, these male characters, meant to be critiques of a certain kind of Iranian male? And he said, no, not at all. And he said, never would I look at something like that. These are, if anything, self-critiques. I mean, he saw himself in each of these characters. And I think this is something that goes through really all of his films. And it's something to think about um, as you, uh, as you, you know, follow his development as an artist. Uh, and also there is the theme of life versus death, which uh, came out of um, the, uh, the, the really the trauma that he experienced with the earthquake and seeing the devastation that it caused. And it, life versus death and his appreciation of life goes through the rest of his films, I think, is a very important theme. And certainly in um, uh, the film we'll see tonight, Taste of Cherry, that is an important element. Uh, there are also films, so many of his films have to do with journeys or quests of some sort, which is something that comes, that comes out of uh, some of, out of uh, Iranian poetic tradition, that the mystical quest and all of that. But it's also, he liked to drive. And uh, we see characters of him, uh, in his films driving all the time, characters in cars. And there were various reasons for this, but beyond the fact that he liked to drive, uh, one being that uh, women can be in, sort of in, in, in a private space that's also a public space. They, in Iranian films during the Islamic Republic, they have to have their hair covered if they're... I mean, they have to have their hair covered in, in any film, but it, uh, it's only realistic if they're doing that outside the home 
uh, if they're in a car. So that, that's one reason for his, uh, his films that have to do with uh, women in cars. But uh, beyond that, um, the next two things I have that sort of go together, these are the things that had, came along with uh, Close Up, the film Close Up, the, the uh, blurring the line between documentary and fiction. Uh, the close-up really does that. I mean, it's really very hard to tell which is which, and you have to really study the film uh, to understand how the fictional elements relate to the documentary elements. And in essence, he's made a, a kind of a fiction using real people in, and, and based on a real situation. But he's manipulated it so much that you really can't call it a, a strict documentary. And it's something that really got a lot of attention from, from this film in particular, but it also figures into other films as well. And he said at one point, uh, you can only approach the truth through lies. And that's one of the things that he is sort of has a philosophical take on in terms of what cinema does, is that it, cinema gives you, uh, you know, kind of fictions or lies or whatever, but they're really pointing toward the truth. You can't approach the truth really directly. And the other thing is the self-reflexive cinema, films about filmmaking and filmmakers really started with Close Up, and you know, as I said, uh, the two films that come after that, which are not you know, the two films that are uh, the second and third in the Coker trilogy, namely um, uh, And Life Goes On and Through the Olive Trees, have to do with filmmakers. And these are very complex and fascinating portraits of, uh, of uh, filmmakers and uh, ones that ask questions about what their role in society is. So, this is another element that he introduced into Iranian cinema. The others followed, and there were a lot of films made about filmmakers and filmmakers filmmaking after uh, he started this. And another thing that I think is important about his work is its constant, his constant experimentation. One thing that I really admired about him, and that's in some cases perplexed me when I would see a new film, I thought I had a reading on what he was all about, and then I'd see a new film, and I'd be totally stumped until I had the chance to spend time with it and think about it and look at it and in many cases talk to him about it was that he never really repeated himself. He would take leaps in new, uh, new directions uh, at every turn and there was also a lot of, of playfulness and humor in his films. I mean, the film that we're going to see tonight, Taste of Cherry, probably has the least humor in it uh, of any of his films, but there is, a, a, you know, th throughout his career, uh, starting with the films about kids, a lot of wit and a lot of uh, playfulness in his use of the form. And so the, the following thing uh, I would say, the final thing, is uh, there, there is a, an awareness of uh, the, the ramifications, philosophical and political, of uh, his, his work. I mean, he, he was very attuned to philosophy and he was very attuned to politics. And I think that underneath a lot of his films of the Islamic Republic, there is a kind of a, a level of critiquing of the Iranian uh, of the, the new government in Iran. Uh, he was uh, discreet enough not to be... He didn't like political films per se, uh, but I think there is a political level to a lot of what he was doing. I said to him about um, the film uh, And Life Goes On, and, and all, you know, in, in, which also, that concerns the aftermath of the Iranian Revolution, as does the following film, Through the Olive Trees. Uh, I said to him, one could read this as the earthquake represents the revolution, and uh, we're looking at the consequences of the revolution symbolically in, in these two films, and he nodded and said, yes, you could look at it that way. So he had kind of a, a sly uh, <laughs> take on some of these things, but I, there are things that, you know, if we, uh, I'd like to talk about maybe some of the uh, ram political and philosophical ramifications of uh, uh, Taste of Cherry after we see that because I think that's a film of particular fascination. And I will uh, I'll give here just a quick commercial. <laughs> this is my book that's on sale out front uh, and uh, it's Conversations with Kiarostami. Uh, Ahmad has told me that I'm the only person that interviewed him about all these early films of his. Uh, and uh, this these conversations which we I did over a period of weeks with Kiarostami and, and years actually um, deal with his thoughts on all of these early films that you know, I don't think you can find this anywhere else and it goes up through the masterworks period and then the other film that I have out coming out uh, in the December in the time of Kiarostami is my writings on Iranian cinema over 
three decades. And this picture on the front of the book is one that I took of him standing in front of the emblematic hill that you see in, uh, it's the hill in Coker that the little, ch little boy goes looking uh, for his friend's house in that film, and then you see again in subsequent films of the Coker trilogy. So uh, I really, uh, I, I want to I wanna, uh, show two more things real quickly to maybe uh, intrigue you for the next uh, part of this evening, which is the Taste of Cherry. Uh, you, pro you may recognize this famous painting from the early 1500s by Raphael, the School of Athens, which has uh, a lot of the famous uh, uh, philosophers of antiquity. But there is a, at this very center of that picture, if you know that picture, is uh, Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right. They're the two leaders of the School of Athens. And uh, I'm going to try to make them uh, relevant to the film that you're going to see, although you probably will suspect this while you're watching the film. Anyway, thank you for, for paying attention. And uh, I'll be, you know, I'm going to be here tomorrow. I'm going to be back here to introduce Taste of Cherry in just a little while and then discuss it afterwards. But tomorrow I'll be around to introduce and discuss Certified Copy. And I'd be glad to, I'm also going to do a book signing for my book, but I'll be glad to discuss all of these things uh, with you if, you if you want to talk about any of it. And I think we've got a, you know, maybe five minutes here. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on any of this? Yes, right here. So did the committee, I understand you right, that the committee government uh, sponsored the film that he dedicated and also sponsored this commission? Sorry, I didn't get that. Did the committee government sponsor the filmmaking uh, in the 1980s? And did they also sponsor the distribution? The, the, yes, the government of the Islamic Republic did uh, sponsor a lot of these films that came out. Uh, Kiristami only, he, he worked for Kanun from 1970 under, you know, under the Shah up until the, and life goes on, which was well after the revolution. He continued to work for uh, Kanun uh, through that, that time and then uh, after that he had backing by foreign companies and such. But they did and they continued to, to this day uh, the government to back some films, but it's a complicated situation because they're very repressive in some ways, and then they're very, you know, they're still doing this in order to try to create a viable image and uh, uh, for the, for Iran and to have a, a viable uh, filmmaking industry. Ahmed, did you want to say something? Yeah, actually, I want to say that it's true that the government uh, gave money to fund these films, but it wasn't direct. Uh, the funding. Kanun specifically was uh, getting the funding from the Department of Education. So the government was paying the Department of Education and part of the funding would go to Kanun, and part of Kanun's funding would go to filming. It wasn't like the government giving money to make films. It was to that channel. And also there was, you have to keep in mind something that the technology was very limited. We didn't have digital cameras. The number of cameras that we had in the country were very limited. And sometimes people had to wait for two years to have access to camera, like uh, to be able to make a film, a 35 film. And those cameras belong to the government, to the institutions that usually belong to the government. So you had the only way to make film was to book a camera two years ahead of time to have the camera for two months to go make a film. Other question? Anyone? Okay, well then I'll just say thank you, and I hope you'll come see as many of these films as you can, and, uh, and uh, you know, just enjoy the whole Kiristami experience that you have in this museum. This is really a fantastic uh, exhibition, and I, I, I envy you the chance to spend all this time with uh, the works of Kiristami. Thank you.